In this edition of Embedded Insiders, Brandon and Rich recap the 2020 Consumer Electronics Show by highlighting some of the embedded technology organizations who are diving into the world of open source. Later, the insiders are joined by Mark Corless and Wenzi Jin from the MathWorks, who share their thoughts on the role of simulation technology in ADAS and autonomous drive system designs. Finally, John Labrosse is back with more Things That Annoy a Veteran Software Engineer, where he gets irritated about insufficient documentation. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Embedded Insiders. I am Rich Nass, Executive Vice President with Open Systems Media, and you are? I'm Brandon Lewis, the Editor-in-Chief of Embedded Computing Design. How you doing, are you Brandon? Asking, are you asking me or are you asking the audience? No, I was asking you. I figured you knew who you are. Well, well, without a visual, the audience doesn't know who you are. Well, I didn't know if you had some weird, like, neural connection to the audience. <laughs> and actually, speaking of uh, neural connections, there was some of that stuff at CES that we were both at last week, some crazy you know, brain interface stuff that you've heard. Like, yes. <laughs> uh... I'll go first because you actually walked right into what I wanted to talk about. One of the things that, that I thought was pretty cool was the facial recognition stuff. Um, I know we've been doing that for a long time, but it's so mainstream now. Um, and they can pick out people, as long as you're entered into the database, they can pick you out. And I, I saw a demo where um, they told me how old I was and actually they were off by five years in the right direction so I don't know if they do that on purpose to make me happy but I was happy and they can also tell your mood yeah. which uh, was amazing um, I was very impressed and actually you know when I saw it the first time I was sort of blown away but I and I saw almost an, an identical identical demo uh, three different times um, so it's obviously here yeah, you know, I, it is a good point that you bring up. I think maybe we are jaded because we see and talk about this stuff for so long that by the time, you know, it's starting to actually come to fruition, we're like, oh, that's old hat. But it really does keep getting better and better. Um, I saw out at uh, the NXP booth that, you know, they have their new i.mx8 uh, plus uh, platforms out now. And there, that was single i. .mx8 i dot mx8 plus is running uh three neural networks at the same time uh doing facial recognition you know object detection and then um it's sort of getting towards towards you know my identifying my mood but it's it's just really growing by leaps and bounds and that was obviously on display everywhere at ces yeah just to give the proper props i saw it uh in a demo at st and then another demo at socio next but uh, I take offense there. I'm jaded. I said we both are. So, you know, don't don't feel like you're alone in this. Well, I don't think I'm jaded. <laughs> Moving right along. It's not you. <laughs> it's, it, it's not you. It's whatever was the, the, the you that was detected in that facial recognition demo. That's fair. I'll, I'll <laughs> okay. right. What else did you say? Um, I think it is interesting that more and more and more these traditional embedded companies um, or embedded technologies um, are starting to open source. Um, I saw it from actually the Zigbee Alliance um, and what they have done is they've created um, this working group called Connected Home Over IP and what this is intended to do is a while ago, you know, when everybody started with the smart home and IoT, um, you know, there was that there's that funny comic about, you know, we need a new standard, and then you know there are too many standards, and all of a sudden you have one additional standard. So you saw, you know, Apple come out with its uh, variant of smart home uh, development of a smart home development framework in the form of HomeKit. Amazon had its same thing. Uh, Google had its same thing, and what the connected home over IP does is it basically forms an abstraction layer um, that allows somebody to develop um, interoperable, interoperable connectivity uh, for all of those different frameworks. Um, and obviously that means that Amazon, Apple, uh, Google, and others are going to have to contribute some of their core IP into that working group, but they're doing it. Um, so pretty much if you're developing an IP-based uh, connected home solution, 
regardless of whether you started off, you know, using a home HomeKit framework or Google Home or, or Amazon ecosystem, you should be able to develop an application that um, talks to all of those different devices in those uh, different ecosystems, which really just solves that huge problem of fragmentation that, that we've seen for a long time. Well, I could definitely see those big guys contributing. They use a lot of this stuff as loss leaders. Um, we were talking about uh, Amazon in particular, and they sell these Echo devices either at cost or below cost because it just provides an entree into other stuff where they can make way more money. Um, so I don't see any downside to them putting this stuff back into the cloud. No, for sure. And, you know, to, to that point, um, all of these big ecosystems are, are submitting some of their code. They're open sourcing their code. Um, and I know that Zigbee is planning on developing or, or launching a, a GitHub repo um, in the next uh, couple, three weeks, um, where a lot of that's going to be available, a lot of the, the contributions to that connected home over IP. Um, so be on the lookout. We're hoping to talk to Tobin Richardson of the uh, Zigbee Alliance here in the next couple of weeks, so uh, he can definitely explain more. You doing a promo like the networks for upcoming shows? You know, I just slide it in there, shameless self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, if, if it works for the networks, it works for us. Right. Uh, along those same lines, there was a pretty big announcement. I don't even know if it was an announcement, but I heard about it, and I asked, and it was confirmed, that um, the MicroEM operating system, MicroCOS, is being open-sourced. So now you don't have to pay for the software, they used, they used a weird model where in that you could develop with, with you, were, you were allowed to pull down the code and, and do your, all your development. And then when you went to production with your device, that's when you actually had to pay them. So they're removing that last barrier. Now you, you do everything and, and you don't have to pay them. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. I, can, I understand why they're doing it. I can make an argument in both directions why it's a good idea, why it's not a, why it's not a good idea. But uh, I think in the end, it will be a good thing for Silicon Labs. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, who's open sourcing it? You didn't mention that. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Micrium was, was, was acquired by Silicon Labs, I'll say, three years ago. But I'm, I'm guessing on that. Time flies when you're having fun. Just time um, flies when you're jaded. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, okay. But anyway... Um, and uh, they decided that um, it is readily available, so you can put it on any architecture that you want. You know, I think, I think that's it, pretty big news. Yeah, it is. It, it was. It, it's good that you clarified that because anybody who's used uh, Micro COS, um, you know, for R and D or just fiddling around with in the past will have known that, uh, like you said, you could access a lot of the you know the fundamental um the fundamentals of the architecture and you know, go off and develop on yourself don't want to stereotype here but there's uh, s uh some suspicions that a lot of devices in the far east are running off of uh illegitimately licensed um micro cos uh operating systems but you know that's just pure speculation um i think it i think it's uh, a good move uh, for them to go ahead and open source it, um, as you know, as we discussed before, you know they've also open sourced some Z-Wave, uh, the Z-Wave technology. So it looks like Scilabs is uh, throwing it back into the community and just trying to grow the pie around those technologies. That's what it's all about, growing pie. Well, the you know the other the other more cynical perspective could be that they kind of gutted it for everything they they wanted from it, and you know put it back out on the trash heap, but not that it's trash uh, I, at all. I think it was a more a function of what happens whenever a s silicon vendor gets an operating system. Nobody else wants to work with them. Uh, and, you know, they had all good ties into, into all the other microprocessor vendors, and, and I assume that all that went away, Renesas, NXP, ST. Um, but we'll, we'll never know, and, but, and, I, but well, I, I, I think that's the case. Well, and the silicon guys, you know, that, that it doesn't, it's never really, it, it never fits the business model, right? Uh, you know, a semiconductor vendor, um, you know, you know, how the hell do we pull this, this uh, licensing these, these operating systems or this software into our typical 
uh, business model. We'll just put it into our, our de software development stack and then just hope that that puts more hooks into the developers and they buy more and more of our chips and so on and so forth. And from that perspective, you know, putting putting uh, MicroCOS out there into the wild and letting more and more people develop on it uh, more freely would serve that end. Okay. Uh, I think the FCC just put us into the PG category with your description there, Brandon. Oh, what were you for, a G? Yes, we were. I thought we were rated R. For? Just being, just being cool, just being kick-ass. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the Embedded Insiders are joined by Mark Corless and Wenzi Jin from the MathWorks. As we move towards more and more uh, vehicles that are capable of higher levels of autonomy, um, has that really changed anything uh, within the way that people are using uh, MATLAB and Simulink? Because, you know, when I think of all of the different scenarios that either your hardware or software, or both, obviously, are going to be deployed um, in the real world out in the wild, I mean, it's almost infinite. In automotive, we've always been talking about uh, having a virtual vehicle and, and accomplish development tasks such as checking out software and uh, doing this formal software validation or doing the calibration and doing some of the drivability work using a simulation. And that's kind of a, always a dream in a distant future. We know it's possible, and yet at the same time, there is a very strong tradition of the seeing the metal and uh, go into the vehicle and try things out, getting the comfort that what you're trying out is actually really working in the real world. That uh, culture is changing, and, and not only because people want to change it, but because out of the necessity, uh, because of the, the cost of uh, uh, the prototype vehicles, and often you have to have multiple prototype vehicles for different aspects of development. You may need uh, several vehicles for sensor development, you may need several vehicles for uh, software development, and even down to the calibration and drivability in those, those areas. And uh, there's a the question of uh, affordability. Um, mm -hmm. The car is getting so expensive that you cannot possibly have the fleet that you used to have. So I think the drive towards simulation is happening right in front of us. It's actually happening faster than we ever seen it before. The other part of it is that um, it, it's as simple as you know, we, even though we talk about the level for auto autonomy, there's a lot of challenges certainly with that. But if we just go to the very basic of ADAS systems, the things that we're getting very used to taking for granted, things like uh, autonomous emergency braking, ACC, and so on, even for those systems, there's a lot of corner cases. You cannot possibly replicate using using a vehicle, no matter how much you can shift the vehicle around the world. So that's another drive towards uh, using simulation. But what I kind of wanted to say is that maybe it's mundane, as we always talk about, you know, let's do more simulation. but. I think the real thing that's happening is uh, we're seeing a lot of customers want to do to build a virtual vehicle. And the gap I mentioned early on that customers, uh, they live with a lot of the internally built simulink simulation models for the vehicle. And now we're seeing interest in, let's say, can they get a lot of off-shelf models? Uh, because they don't have the staff to build the models. They may not have uh, the right fidelity for certain components. So we're seeing a lot of the interest in doing more simulation, building a full vehicle simulation. Uh, I think from my understanding is that she's driven by this desire uh, uh, to move from a, a purely physical test world to a much more reliant on simulation and learn to trust the fidelity. Um, but I think that's a process that's accelerating. But now you bring AI in, you sort of have this unknown quantity. Um, does, is that something that you're seeing uh, over at MathWorks? And then how is that affecting uh, simulation that people would be doing in, within Simulink? Uh, artificial intelligence is something that the entire industry is figuring out uh, how to integrate into a vehicle and keep things safe. Um, and artificial intelligence is also something that we're trying to um, make sure that customers can integrate into their uh, design process. So as you mentioned, uh, there's pieces of the design which may be uh, classically kind of controls, uh, controls driven or um, navigation and planning driven and we're kind of coupling that together with um, artificial intelligence for things like perception. Uh, it's important to be able to uh, simulate the entire um, closed loop um, connectivity 
of these different components in order to gain insight into what the system is doing. So from a MathWorks point of view, uh, we see customers using our tools um, in order to uh, train systems, in order to explore them and understand artificial intelligence systems, uh, but then also to be able to couple those with the controls and decision logic to see what their impact on the entire closed loop system is going to be. Uh, one of the other techniques that we've seen um, applied, you know, throughout automotive in general is to have another kind of a, like a like a watchdog process out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe uh, you will have certain things that your artificial intelligence will do to to, to uh, recommend you do something, but maybe you make a decision based on um, uh, sensors like a radar that you trust. So we also see uh, customers trying to look at, at kind of, you know, how can we have um, multiple uh, redundancies in the system and, and how can they work with each other um, to uh, provide a, a safer outcome. So I, I tend to, uh, if I overly simplify um, components <laughs> in an autonomous system, I can, I can overly simplify to kind of a category of things like uh, perception and localization where I am using something like a LIDAR, a camera, radar to detect things around me. Uh, in, in, in that's, that's kind of one um, bucket of capabilities. And then there's another kind of bucket of capabilities that I tend to call uh, planning and control. Um, so once I've uh, detected the things that are around me, how am I going to go about making decisions and how am I going to control the vehicle in a manner that feels comfortable to a human? And uh, we see different customers working in these different kind of pockets. So uh, what, what MathWorks tends to do is we have capabilities for each of those um, buckets, as well as we have capabilities to bring those components together. On the, uh, on the notion of perception and localization, we see this as historically been uh, working with recorded data. So, um, the automotive industry now is in a place where we have a lot of data, we're data rich, maybe almost data too rich. Uh, we have to work with this data, we have to label this data, have to design the algorithms based on this data. This is where you see a lot of the uh, artificial intelligence like deep learning coming in. This tends to be a, a data driven process. Uh, we do see customers that want to simulate data. It seems very, you know, as Wensi had mentioned, we see customers uh, hungry to simulate additional data in order to validate the performance of those algorithms. So that, that's kind of one grouping. The other grouping that comes up is on the controls and decision logic side. Um, for this, especially in the control side, as, as once you mentioned, uh, closed loop simulation is really important. This is where you need to have a good mathematical model of what your vehicle is going to do. Based on this, you can um, explore different uh, controller um, technologies. We see uh, model predictive control is a, a very common uh, uh, approach of adding uh, the ability to specify constraints to the controller that both meet performance requirements as well as meet uh, ride and handling requirements. Uh, and then we see customers kind of bringing those two um, buckets of components together to have the full system level simulation. Um, and this is where when you have this full system level simulation, typically you need a higher, um, you need something that's photorealistic uh, to kind of drive this system level simulation. Now. Although MathWorks has tools for individual in each of these components, uh, the reality is that uh, customers are developing these components in a variety of different tools. So from a MathWorks point of view, um, it's really important that we can co-simulate, that we can interact with these other ecosystems. Uh, ROS is a very common one that we see um, used in the uh, autonomous vehicle space. So what you'll see is that this closed loop system performance um, may be in MathWorks components. Uh, it may also likely be a combination of MathWorks components. Uh, when I say MathWorks components, I mean components that customers have developed in, in MATLAB and Simulink, along with components that they have developed in other uh, environments. Um, on the way out, I, I want to just uh, pose one more question to, to Wensi. Um, you, you mentioned this uh, virtual vehicle. So when you're building a virtual vehicle within um, a MathWorks environment, you're, you're really building something that can be deployed in the real world. Um, it's just sort of like a, a digital twin, right? In more mundane terms, people call it full vehicle simulation. We use that term too. too. But in the end, I mean, the same thing is you have a reproduction of a vehicle um, as a vehicle behaves, and you can use different data to instantiate your vehicle. You may have, you know, 10 different simulations represent 10 slightly different 
version of your test vehicle. And, um, but fundamentally, the software that goes into the vehicle has to conform to a certain standard, as you said, and that's also a big area that we work with the customers. These areas intersect with each other, mm -hmm. and regardless of what you're interested in, whether it's ADAS or a full vehicle simulation embedded software. Now, it's time for Things That Annoy a Veteran Software Engineer with John Labrosse. Hey, we don't have time to document. We, you know, we're press, pressed to actually produce uh, our, our next de deliverable. We've got to release the code and all that. But, but to me, you know, it, it's got to be part of the whole process. Um, you know, this whole thing with agile programming, you know, get a couple of programmers together and then, get, you know, produce a whole bunch of code. That's, yeah, it's, it's fine for some specific code, but, you know, we, we do a lot of uh, stuff with safety critical software and, you know, documentation is quite important in those cases and, and verification of the code and, and making sure you're, you're doing everything right to make sure it doesn't crash or anything. It gets even worse. I mean, we have to rewrite. I mean, how often do programmers get into a, pro a project that somebody did a few years ago or maybe last year and say, oh, man, this, this code is horrible. I got to rewrite everything. And, you know, code should be written hopefully once, not multiple times, especially if it's performing the same function. You know, you don't want to rewrite the same code twice to do exactly the same thing just because you don't understand what was done. So I, I'm a firm believer, and, you know, I, I always document the heck out of the code that I write. You know, case in point, I wrote a few books, so uh, everything is explained. And, and to me, it's not just documentation textual, because a lot of programmers now, they oh, the documentation is the code. Well, no, the documentation is not the code. It doesn't give you a, a, a major picture of the whole, the whole thing. Uh, you'll see just a window of what's going on as opposed to having illustrations. And, you know, that, that's another thing that irritates me. People don't actually uh, do illustrations or block diagrams or, or flow diagrams or whatever it, it is, is needed to actually explain the whole picture. And, of course, now you're, you're, you're stuck with two things. If you have code and you have documentation, you have two things to maintain. But, hey, if that's your job, that's your job. Thanks for listening to this edition of Embedded Insiders. For daily industry news, videos, and podcasts, visit our website, embeddedcomputing.com. <laughs>